What the couch? Hey, hey, podcast. hey, everybody. Oh, I love that intro. Hi, I'm Susan Cowsill. Hey, oh, and I'm Paul. The gal and he drinks it. <laughs> Paul, you should have said, hi, I'm Paul Cowsill. And I'll, yeah, and I'm Bob Cowsill. And I'm Susan Cowsill. No, that was great. I love that intro. You should have done it. Read it and it weep, too. brothers. Read it and weep. So, Hi, so, guys. Yeah. What's up? What's new? What you got? Exciting news. Oh, gosh. We got a great show today. We Dude. have Peter Noon coming on Peter our Noon. show as our big guest today. Wait, wait. Who's that? Oh, you mean Herman of Herman Herman. Oh, yeah. He's coming up. We later. love him. We also got some things to talk about. Yeah, we got news in Council Land because yeah. Rhythm of the World is done. It's massive. <gasps> Oh, I wish I had a bell to ring. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, where's your bell, Susan? The crowd goes wild. Bells. Hey, you know what, what? everyone? We're going to start bringing in sound effects because you can't see us, but at least you'll be able to hear us. We could have had bells there. Yeah. Now, what that I'm means, really hoping they can see us by now. It's 20 songs. These, these, every, we mix 20 songs and then send it. Frank Filippetti mixed it with us. They sent it to Greg Calvi. Yes. They got the mastering done. Yes. And we got it as of yesterday. Now, we know this episode is going to, uh, you know, play months later, maybe, and not, you know, it's not new news anymore. But this is today's news, and that's what we're about. So that's what the news is. It's mass. We're all about current events here. Yes. Yeah. It's so awesome to have and it. And listen, also, to that point, we should let all of our, our listeners and viewers know that we will be getting on all of our incentives. You know, we're all just kind of coming out of the woods here with this situation of the last year. So we'll be on getting all your things mailed out along with this release, this record. The, so don't you worry about music, that for nothing. The pledge music, folks. All right. Your label for yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm addressing. Music, yeah, that's right. I bet you everybody was like thinking, oh man, we're not never going to get our t-shirt or we're never, never going to get, get our, our vinyl. record. <laughs> right, the vinyl part. You're going to get it all, y'all. Give us a few minutes to get back up on the pony. And that's what this is all about, right, guys? Yes. I got to yeah. mention something. <laughs> Susan had a show two oh. days ago. Oh. And so how did that go? Yeah, online streaming. She so. does. She's still, you know why that is, guys? Because I'm young. Uh -huh. And I'm more tapped into the more current ways of dealing with things, True. being the younger member of the family. Yeah, so was it outside? Mind, it was. It was outside. So New Orleans is kind of back to a phase where it's a larger gatherings, still kind of outside and stuff. So this was at a local brewery, um, but out on the lawn. And oh, they had everybody beautiful. with the distance. It yeah, it was really, long. really cool. Um, and it was a wonderful time. You're so brave to do that. Thank you. I, I love that. Brave. It's like, hey, you want to play live? I feel live? great, especially after I watch. No, Go ahead. no, I'm not going to play live. I'm not playing to every other chair. <laughs> I, I mean, I could. Uh, I could, I guess. It's a thing. It's a thing. But listen. Well, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. So, Bob, but don't you think it's interesting? Because I don't think there's any band in the world that has played to fewer people in an auditorium than us. <laughs> that is true. You know, I mean, Remember Branston? Uh, I don't know if it was Monday or Sunday yeah. night. We played to like 10 people. We brought them all up on stage. It was, it was a ball. 10, yeah, it, it was 10 a.m. in Branson, yeah. Missouri. Well, there's that. There's that. Who gets up at 9 a.m. for a rock and roll concert? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, that's and, true. And, but that's how Branson rolled. If any band knows about playing to nobody, it's the cow sales. <laughs> yeah, and, sure. You know, it was a nice crowd out there, and I actually got to share, you know, you know, talk to some people. Did you do a meet and greet? Polly, I did not do an Her official spin. meet and greet because uh, I do not know. I don't usually do those anyway in solo. Believe me, people are lined up to meet us, not me. Trust. <laughs> Number okay. one. But to your point about that, what I did that day is I was able to contact, be in touch with people who had been recently vaccinated. <laughs> that was my thing because okay. we all were still masked. And people are heading my way with their arms and I'm going, what's up? It's like, I'm vaccinated. I'm like, well, bring it in, bring it, you know. So yeah, I got yeah, yeah. hug a couple. So it was kind of my favorite meet and greet ever because I got to really touch a human. Yeah, yeah I'm back sure. Here. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. That, I that's a circulate. Really, that's a good question though, Polly, because what will our meet and greets be like? Yeah, and I'm missing these meet and greets. I mean, we've done meet and greets since we were kids. Dad used to make us go out onto the edge of the stage after every show 
and yep. sit there until all the we did we learned it then yeah. you're right but we're, look yep. i thought of it we're going to provide at the beginning of the meet and greet you know when they first arrive at the tables meet and greet shields and we'll and <laughs> we can autograph the shields and everyone puts yeah. a shield on and we can chat. oh my god we could have council clear shields that we autograph and then they wear them out of there we take photos with the shields and boom shakalaka and we could, and we could charge money to autograph them if it's still on their face because that's going to be creepy <laughs> Because yeah. right, that's what we do. <laughs> I think we could. We'll right. pay them to let us autograph. So we decided uh, something we were going to talk about today, which yes. apparently we don't need anything to talk about. We're just going to talk. But well, we, <laughs> but to, to, to give us guidance, we're going to talk about the very first tour we ever took. And wow. I'm, I'm not talking about the club scene in New England and teenage nightclubs and the comic strip and Venus de Milo where there was always a fight in the audience and uh, Dorian's. We're talking the Yo, first. I loved them. Yeah, the first tour. The first thing we did, and this is the first time we ever flew, okay, was yes. we went to an MGM convention at Lake Tantera, Tantera right? Lake Tantera. Yeah. And, yeah, Tantera. And, and we were, it was everyone in the audience was an MGM executive. So they were ordered to like us, I'm sure. And oh, yeah. Big we were bringing home the bacon. They liked us. Well, man, I'm like 17, you know. So, Susan, you're seven, Paul, you're 15, yeah. whatever. And off yeah. we go in an airplane. And everyone remembers their first flight. I mean, I'll never I remember oh, it yeah. well. Barry Kelso showed up on my bed, jumping with his arms extended, going, Are you ready? <laughs> oh, <before. laughs> he did he woke me up like that because hey, did we fly out of providence yeah yeah okay. we did yeah we okay. flew, yeah, sure i know we, little details can get scrunchied huh i'm sure oh, yeah, we connected sure. somewhere i'm sure we connected but we ended up down in lake tantara and, and where is that robert where's tantara missouri maybe i don't yeah, know i'm thinking okay. so I sure wouldn't know look yep. this is a winding snake of a lake we look we'd never been out of newport you, you know and you, in New York City, it's just a little cube of a place. You just everything's New York. This was like, what is this? And they gave us. Oh so wait, I have a question, place. Council Boys. Yes. So when I'm leaving and leaving the island for the first time and going out to the world, see, I'm a child, so I think everything is what I see, and then we go out to the real world, and there's all these other places. Turns out you guys were a little older than me, so you weren't so shocked to find other places, were you? We were as shocked as all get out. Are you kidding? Okay. I'd never been in Susan. a hotel room of what? my own at all. Me and Paul had a room. Okay. We felt like Bert and Ernie. Yeah. We were happening. <laughs> Crazy. I'll tell you, and, and Susan, yes, just for us being a little older, like you said, I mean, when we got to Terra Terra, you yes. know, on that for they we showed up and they gave us speed boats i remember i didn't have one no you i know, know red, but man red, it was in red chrysler speed boats yeah. Paul, and they went fast and we got yeah. our own oh, i don't know how they set that up we you know you we didn't see any money that trip <laughs> but, but they gave us everything no, and, at that resort it was unbelievable yeah okay it wasn't a hit I mean, look, this is our third rodeo, oh, <laughs> most of all, and yeah. you know, later, anyway, right. so, but, but the energy in the room was that this is going to be their hit. That was the attitude That's in this true. crowd of these executives, That's and here amazing. they are, and we did the show, we performed, all of us got up there and yep. did our thing. You know, you know, and that was uh, that was what Mom these things were about. I woke up this morning. Oh, you can't see us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we had the choreography that didn't yeah. make sense with the microphones. But it was very cool because you know these they don't happen anymore. There's no record company, no. so there's no district guys. But back then, all these things would happen, and it was almost like just getting everybody fired up to take hold of this new product and get it out there. It was and like and a we're promotion like, uh, seminar. It was, it was amazing. Seminar, and it affected yeah. us. We we bought into yes. it. That we, this is going to go. Give me that we red price for life. <laughs> yeah, we did. We All right. Really so that was the first trip, but but then there was the first tour tour a oh national from the east coast to the west coast and all points in between. Uh, first tour for me, my first impression of that first tour was what as we were driving and we were getting into different what was once we left the island. We used to have cows in the back of our house on Forest Avenue. Do you guys remember? Sure. Oh, yeah. The cows in the back. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You guys spent a good deal of your time convincing me that they belonged 
to me. They were mine <laughs> to watch, mine to take care of, mine to not lose track of. If they're not there, it's my fault. And I would go outside every day in that backyard and make sure the cows were there. Okay. She believed everything we ever said to her. She was she did. Through. So we are pulling away and I remember getting far enough away and seeing my first cows behind a fence and I freaked out. And I said to mom, I started crying and I'm like, my cows got out and they're over here. And she's like, what are you talking about? And y'all are in the back of oh, Because she didn't <laughs> know I'm a cow watcher out back at Forest Avenue and have carried this with me. We don't even live there anymore. And I tell her how you guys told me those were my cows. And she, man, I don't remember who she unglued on. But she turned around and goes, have you people told her that every cow belongs to her? And y'all are like, well, maybe. <laughs> so Susan, we walked. We walked across the street to the to the dairy to pick up milk every single day. We brought it back. We had a freezer just for milk. Yes. And it was the old time. So they had those funny finger holders that just cut into your fingers. And we had to walk there and back until we got yes. all the milk. So listen, we might not have owned those cows, but we bought those cows time and time over. Yeah, whatever. So I was traumatized. Didn't understand there was a world out with other cows and other fences. That's so they, my best story. So they give us a tour bus. There's going to be a tour on, a, on one of those tour buses. But this is like 1967. This was literally a city bus and with all the seats in it. Yeah. <laughs> and this it was, was a trailblazer. Yeah, we, this was what we were going to go on. It smelled so bad, right? The fumes inside the, the, the bus. Do y'all remember that? Well, yeah, the fumes you never I forget. Don't. I smell bus fumes today. It's like, is there a tour somewhere? Where's the tour? I hear smell a tour. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. What? <laughs> what do you, Bob, tour. what's your biggest tour, first tour memory, if you had one? Bob. Mine? Mine was when the city bus pulled up. And we expected a city bus. No one put couches and TV. Anyway, so when the, and on the side of the bus, as big as the side of the bus, was the words, the cow sills. And, and it was so huge. I thought, like, I'm going to get in that and, and, <laughs> and drive down highways <laughs> and tell everyone who I am. And this is like, the first introduction, like, what are you talking about? And it and it was there, man. It was as big as life. Kind of introverted personality as a young man. And so this must have been a little traumatizing. <laughs> Look, even back then, I would have been very happy just scurrying from town to town, you know, without any right. fanfare sure. like that. The only other time I got affected by the size of our name, by that time, we'd had, you get used to it, was was the lights on the steel pier in Atlantic City. The castles was... Big. so. But that yeah. sign was so huge on that boardwalk. And I kept thinking, look at all these people. They, they got to see it. They got to see it, you know, versus the <laughs> yeah. first door. It's like, what are you doing with the name on the boss? What? <laughs> you know, you change. What? Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's that? <laughs> you, about, you know, the first time. Well, it's funny because I remember that okay, same the bus, the bus pulling up. And, you know, and we're all getting in it and, you know, we're taking off. And I remember looking at dad and I go, well, what about all our stuff? And he goes, don't worry about your stuff. It'll be, it'll be here when you get back. And we never got back. We yeah. never, right. We never went back to Halliden Hall after that first tour. Um, I think we moved to New York then or California. So Man, wait a minute. Did we go from tour right to, to the apartments in Manhattan? Or did we come home and pick up our pillows. The <laughs> trip all was not. The tour that brought us to California was in 69. This is the first tour. Oh, it brought I'm us to LA, all right. Peter, Peter Noon. Peter, you're here. How you doing? Hi, we Peter, gotcha. how are you? I'm great, thank you. Look, my friendly cow souls. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Am I, I a bit early? No, no you're we're fine. We're, we're, doing, we're in the middle of this. We were just talking about our very first, and we mean first, tour. Like I was 17, Paul, Susan was seven, Paul was 15. We, I mean, you must remember, I mean, real tour where you have a record out and you're going around the, your country there. I mean, you must have oh that, right? Oh my goodness, yeah. How old were you? I remember Eight? it very well. I think I was 16 oh. and we, we kind of lived in a van on our first tour. It was a tour around England. We'd, we'd been going for years in, in around and about, but when we got <laughs> hit record, we suddenly got very busy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, it was drive, driving all around England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. It's a small country, but and we used to get dropped home every night after most, you know, at the beginning, we would go home every night after the show. Yeah. And we had Ray Perrin, who was our driver, who would pick everybody up. And, uh, 
you know, it was, it was pretty. And, and this was you. This was you and the Hermits Hermits band that played the clubs and everything. Now you're in the van with a hit record. As soon as we got a hit record, it exploded. We got more. We were always people used to wonder why we were so busy all the time, but it was because we were cheap. Oh, we weren't very okay. good, but we were, we were very cheap. <laughs> and with that, and, um, and with that, I would like to officially announce to our listeners. Our guest, Peter Noon. They knew you oh, were coming, yeah. but we're here. Oh, so let's go. Yeah. I'd like to do a formal introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, nice uh, to see you all. One of five kids. He's child number two. So we can get into middle, maybe bordering on middle child syndrome, possibly. We'll get into stuff like that. But we give you Peter Noon. Yes, we do. We played in a club in Newport, Rhode Island when he had his hits and we played every one of those songs every night of our life we played something ah oh, great this is you know i always i always remember we were on the same label for a bit remember there as well MGM, like uh, 1965 yeah. 64 65 i remember meeting you and and i remember thinking you know that they know what they're doing. That's like the Beatles in a way, you know, because they're going to have fun. They're going to play music and it's going to be fun and they're going to enjoy doing it. And, you know, they'll, and, and I remember th there were many people, you know, I think Zal Yanofsky from, from Loving Spoonful was a guy who wanted to play music and have fun. And Keith Moon and Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. They That's were a vibe for sure, Peter. Wow. Into playing music and enjoying, you know, the whole... If you see if you see pictures of the Beatles like at Shea Stadium, they're looking at each other like oh. <laughs> I know. love that shot. The, the guitars on walking it. to the stage. You bet. Yeah. There's yeah. plenty of hundred years guys like that. And then a hundred years later, I was on a cruise and I didn't I didn't see I don't see anybody yeah. on the cruise because I'm I'm kind of confused about that like um hang out with the stars thing, because there's right. a lot of uh, can I have a hug going on? And and I'm not a big fan of that. I'm a, actually a real hermit on a ship. But I remember at the end of the <laughs> cruise, I went, I went out with Charlie Davis, who is a who works who works for Paradise Artists, and we went to watch your band. And, and me and Peter Asher uh, announced you. Yes, and get it. <laughs> I remember you bought such a good. It was what exactly what was needed because you know there's a lot of drunk old people on the boat and everything. And suddenly you came out like a, a breath of fresh air, and everyone goes, "Oh, great! Somebody who really is enjoying the yeah. fact that they had a few hit records." <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you absolutely. for those accolades, Peter. But this is our interview with you, sir. <laughs> Peter, we are very proud of our three hits. I must tell you, and we love our gold record. Pete, this guy had 14 gold records, 14 yeah. hits. It's like we. The Happy Together tour we do every summer, and six of us are needed to bring forth what we all did on our own at, at one point in all our lives. But Peter Noon goes off, and he he doesn't need five other groups. You know, he's he's so big. Well, it's so you know big. I used to love you know when when probably th twenty years ago you could go out on a an old, you know, CBS radio stations had them led like FOX in Atlanta and they were all over the place right. in Pittsburgh. And, and you could go on a bill with the tops and little Anthony and Dale Shannon yeah, and yeah. Luke Christie. And, yeah. you know, there were all these and Dion and there were yeah. all these people. Who of stars. And somebody, somebody went and bought all those radio stations and closed them down. Oh. That was the end of that. But that was that the precursor. <laughs> I mean, look, the Happy Together. Somebody tour, who didn't like music bought them. You get 35 hits at the night of a Happy Together tour. You can imagine Peter on the Happy Together tour. Well, you can only do three songs, Peter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, that wouldn't work out. I, I did. I did one date w w in California where the Happy Together tour went on, and then I went on afterwards, and and you know. When, when I toured with Mickey Don Lentz and Davy Jones and, and all those people, I say, you can only do top tens. You can only do songs that were in the top 10. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I sneak in leaning on a lamppost, which was only number 11, but you know, oh. they don't <laughs> check on me. In. But it's interesting. It's so much more interesting for the audience that somebody doesn't do a 22 minute guitar solo with the head down, showing off a nice little ball patch yeah. and gray, <laughs> greasy hair sleeping down. You know, so I think the audience, I think the 
the oldest audience, whatever that is, and there's quite a lot of young people in it, but it's, let's call it oldest, because remember, they always said oldest but goodies. Yeah. So yeah. that means you're both, you're old and you're good. Yeah. yeah. Anybody who's no good is not is still around. You know, no, that. No, it's hard to say in show business. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's he a looks a little like Robert Redford. Do you think he looks a little like Robert Redford? I think he does. Who? Yes, yes I see. see. Yeah. Don't you yeah. see it, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Now we have questions, Peter. Yeah, we have I questions. see Paul is Paul, you're, for him. Paul, fire. Well, what I'm chomping about, I, I want to go all the way back because you know, we were little kids and and you know, we had a dad and he was really driving our train, you know. Uh, we weren't making any decisions, we weren't doing anything, you know. We went from being in little league all of a sudden to being in this band. But you're 15 years old, you're at the top of the heap at 15. So, what was I mean, how did this start? What got into your mind at 12 or 13 saying, Man, I want to be at the top of the heap by 15? Maybe a long story, Lancer, but okay. August the 3rd, 1963. Okay. I'm I was probably 13. 14. I don't know how old I was, but August to August in 1963, me and my friend Alan Wrigley were rehearsing a song. It was probably, it was one where we couldn't figure out the words. I think it was The Wanderer by uh, Dion. Um, there was a, some words in it that we couldn't figure out. We listened to this record over and over. And in the background, we hear somebody else playing music far away. And we go out of the door and we can hear it. And it's a little bit loud. And we cross a field and then we cross another field. And there in the field are the Beatles playing on a stage this high. Wow. The stage you could step off, off the ground onto the stage. And they just come back from Hamburg. And I stood, I was completely, you see, awesome has been used so much. Everything is awesome. Oh, awesome shoes. I'm talking, I was in awe of this thing that I'd seen, this thing, this, this total package of, you know, and they were doing like a miracle song and, and, and Ringo did a song and, and John sang a song and they were all interacting with each other in, in this beautiful thing called a beat group. And I stood there transfixed and the guy I was with, after two songs of the Beatles, he used the F expletive and we are effed. Oh. And he quit <laughs> show business forever. Uh, and I, I had that reaction to a Roy Orbison show on television once. I said, who I think I am. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. So you know what I'm saying? So, so from that minute, I decided, and here's the story, really. I was, a, I was always a persistent little shit. Okay. Always. I always constantly, constantly, constantly worked harder and harder than everybody else, which is confused with persistence, just wanting to make it. So I was insistent, and I... I said, I'm going to find some guys who rehearse all day, every day. You can't have guys who quit their job. Hmm. Because remember, I was, I was young, but everybody else had a job. When you were 15 in England, you had to go to work. Yeah. Sure. You, there was no options. You either went to school and went to university or you went to work. So I, and I, you know, I found four guys who believed in me. And that was Keith Hopwood, Carl Green, and then Barry Whitwam and Keith Hop, you know, and Barry Whitwam and Derek Leckenby, who said, you know, he's got a lot of dates. I asked Keith, when did you join the band? He said, I joined the band the day I found out you had over 100 concerts booked. And we were not unknown. <laughs> but wow. We, 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 he wanted but, you work. Know, I, I'm doing this thing called the Peter Noon Collection, which is all the tickets and all the ticket stubs and everything. But and it go, it all features that period of, of my yeah. uh, beginning. Oh. And we would play. We were the band group that could play the caverns three times. The cavern three times a day. Nobody else could. You would. Uh, there was a lunchtime session at, and for really girls on their lunch break. And I and and girls used to like just do a thing jiving on their own while a band was on for an hour. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, and we'd go from 12 till two. And then there was a thing called Junior Cavern and no one talks much about Junior Cavern because it was kind of a throwaway thing. It happened between four and six um, and there was no alcohol and people would go after school. So you, so you imagine the audience is very, very young, younger than nowadays, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, sure. well, maybe though. So it, it was, was a teen. It was a teen club between four and six. Exactly. It was called the Junior Cavern, and it was teens. Yeah, awesome. no alcohol. Now, and let then me... for some for Go some ahead. reason, we 
Bob Wooler liked us. The guy who ran the, who booked the cavern liked Hermes. I, I say to people, why did, how did we get to play there three times a day? And they said, well, Bob Wooler liked you. Oh, okay, that's okay, we'll take that. It was really because we were cheap. And that's um, so we would play three times. And we, of course, at night time, you got to play with the Undertakers and the four, uh, the Foremost and Jerry and the Pickers, all the big shot bands. Oh, you know, wow. before that, you'd play with the Escorts and Junior Cavern would be Escorts and Mavericks and Four, you know, different Remo Four and all those things. And we played so much that people started to believe that we were good. And, uh, and we would also different and see because no other bands if you played the cavern you couldn't do everybody was doing the same songs uh, right. every band every band in liverpool and manchester played the same songs every now and then uh, wayne fontana or someone would find um 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 by major lance and that video oh where'd you get that from uh, but everybody else was playing you know fortune teller uh, coasters you know all those early yeah. songs bands, basically it's, right we're all were all around those early coasters things you know yeah, yeah my god yeah. you're all for free you know all of that stuff was uh -huh. going around so we decided that if we wanted to be uh, acceptable you know get more work than everybody else we had to play different songs couldn't do roll over beethoven because guess what someone had done that roll over beethoven could do memphis tennessee because you know it was like, so we were looking for songs that no one did and we came up with mrs brown you've got a lovely daughter and my boy lollipop because boy, strange, love that exactly. <laughs> Did it quite a bit higher than that though. In, in my, my full boy, voice. Lollipop. Here there you go. Beep. My boy, lollipop. Okay, all right. <laughs> my boy. <laughs> but, you know, I was pretty confident that no other groups would do that song in Liverpool. No, I'm sure, Peter. But <laughs> let, I think that was a reasonable thought. All right. <laughs> now, while you're going through all of what you just described, which is like. That's great. He's talking about like 15 to 16 year old kid here, you know, back at home. Are your parents supportive? Are they resistant? Are they going to, to, to you've got to talk to Peter? He can't get this music thing out of his head. Uh, you know, it, my parents had moved to live. My band was in Manchester from the beginning. You know, we were always a Manchester band. That was our, you know, everybody in the band was from Manchester. My parents had moved to Liverpool. I think we even know that. <laughs> my, my parents had moved to Liverpool. So the only way I could keep the band going was I, I lived with my grandparents and my grandparents lived in Manchester and I was always the last one to be dropped off. And I don't know if you remember your grandparents, but my grandparents were kind of old. Yes. They're not as old as I am now, but at the time they were old and wow. they were deaf. So you could, you could set up a whole drum kit in the dress it downstairs. And, and have girls over and have a party if you wait in the clock because at nine o'clock they were definitely asleep <laughs> the, teeth, the teeth were in the glass and the hearing aid battery it was in the charger and uh, they you were can you asleep. can rehearse there you rehearse there with this band well we did we had a, we, we our rehearsal space was we had a, a drummer at the beginning steve titterington and his sister was a police officer and we rehearsed there because no one ever complained. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Genius. Wherever you can find it, right? You got to do it. Susan. Yeah, we used to rehearse in his front room with the windows open and everything. And, you know, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a charm period, you know, because people didn't complain at all about anything. No, you know, we did that too, Peter. Were charmed by the... Oh, the yep. musicians, they let them have a bit of fun. You know, it really was a different... It was before we world. became second-class citizens. Yeah, we did the same thing. Artists. We did the same thing. We would set up on our porch uh, at our house in Newport and kids would gather on the lawn. It was more, it's a novelty also. Like back then. Exactly. That's probably the only group you knew doing that. <laughs> and I think probably the fact that our parents at all in, I'm talking about English people. I don't know about America. I don't know much about American culture before I arrived here, but I, I think our parents, like my dad was in a band, so he knew Okay, cool. my dad was in a band. And, and you know, he was, an, and Huey Gibb, the Bee Gees band, and, you know, John, Freddie Lennon wasn't in a band, but he was kind of a character, could have been in a band. So 
most of the people's parents had a taste of it. And um, our moms and dads had been, had been doing a thing for years called ballroom dancing, which meant you'd go out and a band would be up there. So a band was kind of an acceptable. Interesting. Of, was, it was a, equal to a pub. Mm -hmm. And did they enjoy? They're like, they're like another pub. When, oh, yeah. when you had your first hit, did your parents just, just and grandparents just go, oh my God, he did it. Were they just so excited? You know, I don't know because I, um, it's one of, a great sadness is I never let them tell me they were proud of me. I, I think I just deserted them. You know, I, I left, I ran away from who they were. You know, but that's what people, you know, what happened was the minute that I, the minute that the record got in the charts, I got a car. You know, I was too young to drive, but I still got a car and I got a driver and, and I, he would sit there and be the, the co co you know, he'd be the person who let you be a provisional driver. Yeah. His job was just okay. to sit there while I drove 140 yep. miles an hour around England. But and you're a minor at the time. But you're I know, but I only got caught once. <laughs> oh no listen i'm not chastising you i'm just trying to get the 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 atmosphere is like this kid is an adult as a kid he was yeah you know but definitely uh, you see how how i saved myself and i think i think this is important because you know we know all these sort of child stars who get in all sorts of you know, emotional problems, we'll call it, or, yeah. or psychological problems. I don't know. I, there's no there's no right way to say it. But because I didn't have anybody taking care of all my business, like a mom or a, or a woman who wrote all the checks and somebody, you know, how it started out was we got a van. So I knew how to get a van because I was, I used my dad's credit card, credit okay. account. And... <laughs> No other people had that much. So right from the beginning, I was in control of, of my emotion. You know, nobody, oh, I'd like to go to America. Well, you're going to need a plane ticket and you're going to have to go to the airport and you're going to manage <laughs> all that myself. Yeah. God. You see, and a lot of child star people have some whole show and they don't get in. You know, so I was a reality was really, the reality hit me really quickly that this is going to be, you know, I can, I can still remember it. I got on, on a bus, the number 23 double-decker bus, because you could smoke. Okay. If you got on the number 23, you could go upstairs and you could smoke. And I in the charts. I'm into something good was in the charts. But I was still living at my grandmother's. So okay. I went to the bus stop and I, got, I went upstairs and I got my own cigarettes. I'm still too young to buy cigarettes. But they have a machine. <laughs> you know, it's pathetic, really. There's a machine that you can put money in. So I'm sitting up there and I'm smoking. And I think the bus conductor is going to tell me off for smoking. Because once upon a time, there was this whole respectable society where the bus conductor said, you're too young to smoke, get off the bus, and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, he'd, he'd have, he'd, you'd have to beat him up to get rid of him now. I mean, yeah. so, so now, so, so I'm sitting there, and he goes, what are you doing on the bus? You've got a number, you've got a hit record, you should be in a taxi. And <laughs> you know what? I was like, he's right. He's right. I'd never been, I'd no, I had no idea how to get a taxi. Peter, you live at your you know grandmother's I mean? house. You have a hit exactly. record and you're living at your grandmother. I mean, aren't fans gathering outside? <laughs> not not really, because yeah, early because a little early in the game. It's so it's so not early obvious. in rock and roll, you guys. People yeah. aren't nuts yet. <laughs> yeah, people no, aren't no, nuts. but they were it was not obvious the fan club kind oh, right. of thing. Like right. the general right. public are now aware of me. Yeah, which is a new thing. So yeah. Ooh, we know that. Margaret. We, we got we got the names of all the followers. Margaret at the cavern. And we know the names and the legs of Daisy. Sure. We all know our little thing. And by the way, every group in England knows each other because we've been traveling around yeah. and we've met each other in some pubs, yeah. in transport cafes. So it's actual decent conversation and uh, always about music. And gigs and where are you playing? How much do you play? How much do you get? How much? It was all that kind of great camaraderie. Yeah. So, so I decide now I'm a pop star. So I'm gonna. I asked my dad, can I? I'm gonna kind of. If it is, I would have still gone, but I just a fight. And he said, yeah, yeah, he's getting moved to London, and I get a muse flat is um a little room ab above the stables 
<laughs> stable groomer used to live. And what's happened over time is now time. you really hit the big time. <laughs> yeah. And it's cute. It's cool. It's, yeah. And now you park your car in the, where they used to keep the horses, okay. all the smell has gone as well. So you could get your car in there and you live upstairs in this little room and it's got a bathroom and a teeny, teeny, weeny kitchen, about as big as a laptop kitchen. And, uh, and a bathroom with a bathtub and everything, and a skylight, so oh, climb wow. out We're upstairs. Happening. So it's like a little muse, and George Harrison lives down the street, so now I'm a pop star. And you, you never go back. You know, the Beatles never went back to Liverpool either. You go, you move into this new scene. And, you, and, and what, what, I mean, think about it. The Beatles are driving around in a van. They're driving around in a van and they're all hanging out and they do a show and uh, well, what was that? What was that? What bloody hell? What was that? And you know, do you and then suddenly they all go to London dating models and doctors' daughters and stuff like that. And they don't have that same camaraderie. And that's what happened to us. So I moved to London and now I'm going out to the ad lib, lib club. And because I'm young, I can't, I'm not old enough to go into anywhere. <laughs> He's not old enough I'm not to do old, anything. I'm not old enough to get into any club, but I would tag on. So I'd see John Lennon and Terry Doran arriving in a in that stupid Rolls Royce. Oh, nice! Oh, nice and conspicuous car, John. <laughs> and, uh, Paisley Rolls Royce. You knew him then. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I tag on with them, and he was he was a really nice. See, you're a kid. You were kids, you know, people are much nicer to kids than they are Absolutely. to heavy metal bands. Absolutely. So everyone was nice to me. And, and you know, <laughs> you know, I was a kid and I looked when I was 17, I looked 12. Yes, you, so, you know, I would tag on. And, <laughs> yes, you and did. I'd go to the ad lib club and, and, I'd, and John Lennon, but just by being, I wasn't with him, but I got in the lift with him. So when I arrived in the club, I, they thought I was with him. Oh, <laughs> that's hilarious! I just walk out. And, oh, look, there's John Lennon and an invisible, invisible when you're with. Well, I've got people. a picture of me next to the edge from YouTube that makes it looks like we're hanging out, but we're not. Oh, I got lots oh. of pictures like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, I get in. I get in, and and the the cocktail waitress, snooty English cocktail waitress, you know, probably forty years old in those days, cocktail waitresses. So, she comes over and she she looks at me and she goes. There's a two drink minimum, you know, meaning <laughs> yeah. you're not, you're not 18, get out of there. <laughs> and John and said, that's right. Uh, I'll have two Bacardis and he'll have two Cokes. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he gave him these two little bottles of Bacardi about this big. And he gives one to me and I have a Coke and not, not a word was needed to be said, but wow. I get it. Back in the day, man, wouldn't be like that now. This is not critical information I'm going to ask you about, but but it, it's we want to hear about Blair, Dennis, and Bernard, because guys, oh, this yes. gentleman's, well, I have name, that on my this gentleman's name is Peter Blair Dennis Bernard Noon, and it's like. So you, I was going to ask, who's Dennis, who's Blair, middle, and who's Bernard? When it came to middle initial, did you panic and what did you do, like BDB or PBDB? Hey, it sounds nice, PBDB. <laughs> no, it's got a nice sound. So <laughs> noon, noon is my father's last name. Oh, all right, Peter, we all we all have that. So far, so good. <laughs> Peter is one of my brothers, my, my mother's brothers. Okay, excellent. Okay, hey, Blair is my mother's maiden name. Peter oh Blair. God. So I'm now called same as her brother, Peter Blair. Then Dennis is my father's name. So I got Dennis Noon in there. I got Peter Blair and Dennis Noon in there. And my mother's favorite brother, he's got to be in there as well, but he's a priest. <laughs> so, Bernard? So I become, got to have his name as well. So I become Peter Blair, Dennis Bernard Noon. They didn't want to offend anybody. I was like, wow. <laughs> that is children, the children were once so, you know, Catholic families in the period. Oh, children yeah. Children were like precious. So Precious because our parents had been in the war. You know, my, my, yeah. oh, what, another reason why I was at my grandmother's, my parents were at university. <laughs> I forgot that part. So, oh, so what happened after the war? Were you young enough to be at university? You, you could go, you could go in, because the war had broken up their education. Oh, uh, okay. So okay. My, my father was 18 on the day that the war broke out. 
the Second World War broke out. So he was gone and he missed his university. So when I was a kid, my mother was at Cambridge University and my father was at Edinburgh University. Wow. And kids were really precious things because, because of the war and boys were extremely precious because there was a shortage of boys. Yeah. There was a shortage, was a shortage. of... <laughs> Can you imagine it? You Actually, wonder yeah, why after two world wars, why there was a shortage of boys. Yeah. So all boys were kind of were precious. And, and, and you know, we, the, the, pet, the government, had, when I was born, the government had given my parents a house, a prefabricated house. And since, since I was born, my parents had done a little bit better every, every day. Every day it was a little bit better. Mm -hmm. and, and I sometimes think, and that getting better every day thing happened for everybody on the planet for about 50 years. Yeah. Every day things got better. There, were, there was more food and there was more wealth and there was more health and there was more, you know, 50 years. Look, the music got better and better for 50 years and then it suddenly fell off the edge of the cliff like almost everything else. But my parents for 50 years from, you know, from my birthday, 1947, until probably 1997, the world was on a rampage of bliss and joy. Everybody... Yeah. When, when I was a kid, when I was growing up in Manchester, people had one jacket and one pair of shoes Absolutely. and they were fortunate. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Was perspective for sure. And, and that's in my life, man. People don't forget that when the Beatles showed up with those Beatle boots, as you call them in America, uh -huh. they'd seen them on the Hollies. The Hollies had them first because the, the, the guy who was the Hollies manager had a place in Stockport called the Toggery. And he called, the, they were called Cuban Heel Boots. Uh, and I think they were made in London by Anello and David, which was an Italian guy who'd seen a Cuban guy. And to get a pair of those, you needed to do 10 gigs. Wow. Oh. You couldn't just, start, Dad, can I get a pair of shoes? They were completely out of the question. There was no money around. We used to play for four pounds and we, we would stop four pounds, which is six dollars oh. locally. And by the time we paid the petrol and given the driver a quid for taking us there, a pound for taking us there, we didn't have enough for fish and chips. We only had enough for chips. I mean, it was people who were poor. We didn't know we were poor because we were doing much better than what the so-called so poor people were doing. But we right. never saw them. We were on the bus with all the poor people. We didn't think they were poor. Well, look at the way we got on a bus. Then we look at there is a bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Peter, Peter, uh, I don't know if the guys know this and I'm, we're not going to talk about it because we got we could spend two hours with you, four hours. We might. I, this guy played Pinocchio. He's he was on three years on Broadway. He was like, you know, there's a lot more to Peter Noon than just, you know, Mrs. Brown. But since I brought up Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter, which I bought an orange Gretsch guitar because it had a muffler that I could pull up oh, and yeah. play. Yeah, and I could do that intro. And Mrs. Brown, you- Well, you know, it was a- I even the got a lovely daughter. Oh, good, well done, well done, my son. <laughs> the song came from Because of a Guitar. It was a Gretsch country gentleman. That's what I uh, own. The Chet Atkin. That's what Bob Bob Atkin yeah, Single cutaway. And Keith Hopwood could get that, uh, that sound. Clonk -a -tonk -a -tonk -a -tonk -a -tonk. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. So we, we created, the music came from the guitar you know the bit before we made it was the shadows we didn't know much of, uh, in england there was no english music it was all american music redone by other people yeah still is really you know i actually thought actively as i was i think five years old when mrs brown was at when was mrs brown out 1964 yeah my brother bob as he says bought this guitar and he was playing that song all over our house and Isn't because I'm five, yeah, it was adorable. But here's what I'd listen to Bob and hear his guitar, and he was very good. I could imitate you. You, I'd get in the car with my mom, it would come on, and I thought Bob was you. <laughs> Bob, Bob, you should have sung Mrs. Cowsill, You've Got a Lovely Daughter. I'm telling you, Mrs. Cowsill, You've Got a Lovely <laughs> Go ahead, I, I had to say that. Go. No. I, I also heard that the, the beginning of Silhouettes came about because it was actually the warm-up thing that the guitarist on the session would use to warm up his fingers to Vic record Flick. the song. Is that true? Vic Flick. Yeah, you know, Vic Flick is, 
Vic is this phenomenal guitar. He lives in America now. Vic Flick was the guy who played like, he was in the John Barry set. You see, before, before the Beatles and this thing, there were other bands in England that were brilliant. John Barry Seven was this brilliant touring band that played every kind of music. The, the John Barry of, yeah. of, of, of the harmonica guy, the beautiful s s theme songs? John Barry, yeah, with the James Bond. Shut the so, uh, so, so Vic Flick is the guitar player because he was in the John Barry seven with John Barry. So he's the down, da down, 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 down. And we're, talk we're also talking. <laughs> and, and, he's, and, and the Beatles, the Ringo theme. Down, down, da, 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 the, John Barry the, from the movie is Vic Flick as well. So the session is going really badly. We're doing it. Uh, it we've got it. We're doing it in F, and it goes F to go up D minor. House, F D minor though. Night. Yeah, really. Dumb, really 50s. Took a walk and pass you. And I love that song, don't say that. <laughs> no, but we, the, the version was rubbish. Took a walk and passed your house. Late, late. Oh, that one, yes, yeah. agreed. So yeah. Vic got some <clears> music. <throat> Vic, Vic, got any ideas? And Vic goes, oh yeah, I can look, look, how about this? Da -da 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 -da. Well, what's that? He said, well, it's my warm up, but it's the same chords, you know, all, all songs have got the same chords, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they do. <laughs> and he went, da -da 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 -da. we all went like, Genius. that's it. He's got it. This is going to be a hit. It's turned it. It's going to be a hit again. <laughs> Let me ask now, when you. Went, go ahead. Wait, go, go ahead, Bob. No, you go. No, I've had many well, questions. Well, I was going to say so. Oh, here in Did here it freak? guy living in grandma's back now. You got your own flat. When do you when do you come stateside where we know you and and do you live in the states while you're famous? And I have to ask you eventually about your Sullivan, your Ed Sullivan moment. But when do you come from England to the states? And do you stay and be a star? I think there? February '65 was the first trip that we came into, and and we we got to Dallas and. And it was kind of exciting because we, we it was our first trip to America and we because we were English, we had different views of what America was really like. And and the plane couldn't go to the terminal because there were too many girls in the terminal. So and it was like all those businessmen that you see in movies, you know, on the plane from imagine 1964, who was on a plane, they all looked a bit like uh, you, you know, uh, who was the president at the time. They all looked like the president of the United States at the time. They had the suit on. Say, it's I, Texas, I, and they're really not happy that this pop group has stopped them getting off their plane for their important meetings. Makers. And and they give us a they give us um they pick us up with a motorcade and policemen and everything. You know the Texas thing, and we're like, what is going on here? <laughs> you were going. <laughs> you know, on. What is this about? It was yeah, you. now we're, did now you, we're famous. Did you come to America to to do press, to TV, to or do move? We just never stop. You know, the whole thing is one big th yeah. thing. It started in August 1964, and it didn't end until 1968. This, you know, there's this, like I said, I'm doing this thing called the Peter Noon Collection, where all the tickets and all the dates and all the press and all the things are going to be all in a, in a row. All the Very ducks cool. will be in a row kind of thing. And I see, I'm finding videos of shows I don't even remember doing, which is kind of pop. pop probably typical of a rock yeah. star, but yeah. not a pop singer. But so they're putting this thing together. So in it, there's, you know, I, I wanted to, has anybody got any pictures of Elvis? You know how you do that? You, I'm sure you do that with your, so it's, yeah. you, you say you don't have pictures with him. I do have pictures with Elvis, but I don't have them because somehow over the years, it got put in a box and so on. So I, so I find this person, they send me an article from the Hawaiian newspaper and he says, Peter Noon, Herman, from Herman and the Hermit <laughs> is visiting uh, Hawaii and he's met his all time idol, Elvis Presley. And they show a picture of me and Elvis. And then in the story it says, Peter Noon is with Herman Hermit. And they're on a three, they're on a 360 day tour. And I go, well, a 360 day tour. And you know, we were on a 360 day tour. So no wonder my grandmother didn't know I wasn't living there anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> so when you, you know, it just started one back. day. Yeah. It just started one day and people would say, and because the, the joy of 
being a musician who was getting paid for doing what he would happily have done for free, yeah. which lasted for a long time with us. We were pretty naive. Uh, you know, because every band falls apart the minute somebody says, where's the money? Yeah. We never asked that question. We just said, where are we playing next? Where's next? That's are we on the radio? Are we on the radio? We're still doing That's that, it. Peter. You know, where actually, are we playing next? Yeah, actually, yeah. Peter, with the family. We didn't, talk, in... we didn't talk to the promotion man from MGM Records about the royalties. We talked to him about the promotion. <laughs> yeah, we uh -huh. That's good. So, so anyway, it was like that. And it was a run-on. So I think probably what happened was I left. I left in 1964 on that bus to Manchester I came home in a taxi went to London and then then until about summer of 68 I just was constantly on the road and in the street you remember in wait, 1965 we did 360 concerts and we had 11 top 20 singles in the United States and those were made on the evenings for the <laughs> God, we just yeah. we just were always you know we would finish a gig and we'd drive overnight to london and park in the studio parking lot at 6 a.m and get three hours all smoking everybody smoked in those days yeah no thought of oh i won't be able to sing we just did a gig and we're gonna go straight in the studio and sing everybody's sitting in the van smoking waiting for the door to open at 9 a.m because mickey liked to work in the morning because it was a job <laughs> and uh we'd go in the studio for three hours or, or we were making a movie in, in California and we, we didn't like the songs. So Mickey would fly over and we'd get P.F. Sloan in the studio. And in the studio, P.F. Sloan would teach us the songs and we would record them. This wow. one's like, please, oh, voice, that is a minor. Okay, one, two, take it, done. Next one, hold on, wow. hold on. That's awesome. That's how we were, you know, we were kids and, and the joy of the whole thing didn't didn't leave me you know when i look back at it i don't remember any fights or you uh -huh. know i don't remember jumping off top floors of holiday inns into the pool and stuff like that because I, I must have made it to yeah. the pool <laughs> yeah, well, i i think look you've been a performer your whole life that you never stopped and that's that's well, you're you, that artist, you know. That's a there's a bit there's a there's a bit before Herman Schmitz as well. I was also um, I, I went to Manchester School of Music because this priest at my school thought I was better better at music than he was, and he said you should go to a a night college nighttime college and do music theory really, which, which I never did, um, even though I was at the school, oh. and, and <laughs> they. they sent me up to auditions for actors and things like that because it was just around the corner from the TV studio and I got loads of jobs as like standing actors in big TV shows which all the money from that went to finance vans and stuff like that, a PA. Yeah, answer to that question. I, I had a, so the acting thing, um, that seemed to have started developing and it seemed like it took up a lot of your time. Uh, I think in the 80s and the 80s and the 70s. And so how were you at learning lines? Very bad. I mean, that always scared me. I was a theater uh, arts major in college, and man, it was like, oh, God, I got to learn all these lines. You know, I'm not good at it. And, you know, some people are naturals. Yeah. And I think I think probably now I, I built up the fear factor. You know, it's like fear of flying. If Absolutely. you don't do it for a while, it gets it only gets worse. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. you know. But, but it's consequently, I've done plays, I did a thousand performances of Pirates of Penzance and yeah. never went up on a line. But I can't remember one of the lines now. Oh. But I once, I once did an improv comedy class and you know, I like to be busy, so I've done lots of stuff. That's the answer to that. I always, you know, the 70s was not kind to 60s music. It was right. actually unpleasant to 60s it was. music. It was. We were a bunch of doofers for, for some reason. Yeah. So, I, I wasn't going to quit working and get a job as an accountant because I, I couldn't do a good job as an accountant. So I just kept doing things and I would join classes and, and I'm now out of Herman Schmitz and I, I said, I'd like to be an actor and do, you know, and because I've been an actor, but I've just, you know, read two lines, you know, yeah. you come into the shop, you know, stuff like that, you know, the, no, when it's yeah. your turn, <laughs> you speak when it's your turn. So then I realized that you had to take lessons 
So I joined all these great improv classes in LA where, you know, everyone else in the class became famous except me. Uh-huh. But they were really good, fun things. They're really good, fun shows to do. And I would, and I would strike out because I didn't care. They were a bunch of, bunch of actors, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that scary. Just a bunch of actors. So, right. you know, so entertainment is entertainment and you're an entertainer. And, and I would learn lines and I did, I did, I thought I'd do, I, I, read all that you know Stanislavski stuff and I thought yeah. I could take a Shakespeare piece and piece and that the, the king here cousin sees the crown and do it like Elvis Presley you know there's a new king of rock and roll and do it like so I learned this whole piece and I did it and it was astonishing really because it was an, it was an improvisational class but it was dramatic everybody else was doing drama and I did this piece from Shakespeare really you know here cousin sees the crown and, and it's got unbelievable lines in it, like, um, so Judas was to Christ, yet he in truth found truth in all, found truth in all but one. And the audience of actors and actresses laughed from beginning to end. It was like, I, it was like, <laughs> devel- I, it was the life of Brian. Yeah. <laughs> here, awesome. I am doing, here I am doing this really... Why am I sent for to a king before I put off the regal <laughs> thoughts? To me. And, and I open my eyes and look around, and I, I see it over. <laughs> but I realize the choices are killing me. By the director, the choices, and and the good thing about being an actor is it's the opposite of being in a band. Because if when I'm in a band, I tell everybody else what to do. You do this, you did it, did it. But when you're an actor, you have to. Pay attention to what everyone else is doing. Yeah, you stand goodness. over there. Don't that stand there. Horrible. Don't stand there. You absolutely that sounds no horrible. Said. <laughs> right. It so yeah. it was a whole right, new listen. thing for me. So I had to go back and, and I thought, I'd like to be on Broadway. That's like, what would you like to do next? I'd like to be on Broadway. I know it took 10 years of lessons to get good enough to get on Broadway. I got on Broadway. I go, holy, these people are so talented. I can't believe they're not famous because talent isn't enough to be famous you know that no. yeah yep. you gotta be lucky you gotta do a lot of logistics now listen we we got we could talk for hours we, maybe we'll do another time with we with should do on the road when we're on the cruise Oh, well, yeah. we'll do that. We'll bump into each other as the, as what happens on the Flower Power cruise. Um, but we, we want to play a song. Oh, don't talk always, about the cruise and make me so sad. We always play a song of the week, and we're and we want to play. I think Paul said it's kind of a hush, right, Paul? Yes. Yes. Yeah, kind of Great a hush. One. And so we'll give you a little bit of kind of a hush, and then we'll say goodbye to Peter and uh, tell him. But we're gonna have to have Peter back. We're gonna, there's you, you're Absolutely. the second of our guests that we want to do a twofer with. Absolutely. Okay, I'm ready. Yes, kind of hush. Who doesn't love that kind song, Bird of Hush? That is the prettiest song. I love that. Bob, that was the best song you ever recorded because I thought you were Herman Hermits for so oh, long. <laughs> hey, so Peter, go ahead, Paul. Okay, I was just wanted to mention I, I just loved um the red button thing, ooh girl. I mean, because oh, yeah, I don't right. I didn't hear you. The, the, you. You sound great with harmonies behind you. You know, it, it's having harmonies with your lead vocal and is like a departure. And boy, it sounded awesome. I loved it. Yeah, it was good. It was a good song. I, I, I liked that. The that play chorus the song, was I crazy. loved it. And uh, they did a great job. That red button, they really did. I love all the guitars on it. Never mind the vocals. The guitars are fabulous. Yeah. And you can see all, you can see so much. If you want to Google Peter Noon, yeah. make sure you have a week. And just with nothing to do. I know <laughs> just, I wanted to, oh boy, I know we're winding it up, but how is working with Carla Olson? She's an old friend of ours. She's great. I love her. I've done a few things with her. You know, we've She's done wonderful. bits and pieces. You know, she gets great people showing up. Uh, uh, great people showing up for her. She's been around a long time. She's a very nice lady. I always, very whenever nice they call lady. me and say, would you do this? I, yeah, I'm at what time? No, you she's know, a good the, gal. I just did a... Um, I did a cover for something that she and Saul are working on, but I think that's, you're, you're amazing because like you said, you started when you did and, and I, I didn't realize you just recorded in 2020 with a pal of mine. And I just thought, look at that cat go. <laughs> yeah, still going, yeah. yeah I'm still is. only 73. I think I've got another 10 good years. You maybe. do. We're gonna be the last people standing, you and us. We're the there, there you go, yeah, that, the less competition. 
You know, somebody yeah. said, what's the secret of your success? And I said, I outlived all the competition. <laughs> Yo, well, yeah. seriously, Peter, they tell us we're the youngest of this generation. And once we're gone, yeah. it's gone. So we want to yeah, thank Peter. It's Newton. a shame, isn't it? It's a shame, I think. That's a sad note, but it is a shame that there's, you know, I saw, I read Bob left set, you know, eventually Bob Dylan dies and Ringo dies and, then, yeah. and there are no, there are no fantastic people to take their places that everyone can go. Oh, wonder how old he is. Well, guess you know what, what I mean? guys, somebody's we won't be carry, here to witness that. <laughs> somebody's got to carry yeah. the torch to the end and we'll be there in the end. That's for sure. Susan, you were only seven. Well, you old. have a last thing you want to ask him. I just wanted to say to Peter that, um, over the years, we did your My Generation show. Um, you have, whether you knew it or not, you have been championing us, uh, you know, always, always yeah, talked well about us and, and you've always uh, treated us with respect. And, you know, we've hit a lot of roadblocks in our life with this music thing. And, and you were always there opening your arms to us and going, hey, come on. Yeah, yeah. I know. You know why? The first time I ever heard of you, there was this guy called Neil Bogart. Oh my God, who, Neil! Yes, Neil Bogart. I, I think he ended up with a label like Casablanca, and he was he was yeah, an awesome man for MGM Records. And he played me your record. He said, "Hey, listen, to this record, oh, man." Oh, cool! Oh, cool! Man, that. That I don't know what so it was. Cool. Probably the Flower Girl. Uh, yeah, Flower. Right. But we no, wanted to thank then. you. We wanted to thank you for that because yeah, there are not many people that got our backs. Paul Revere. <laughs> we will see you on the high yeah. seas again. We know this. It'll we'll see you that. soon. See you on the road somewhere, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we want to. We, want we to can't tell you how guys. much we appreciate you hanging out with us, Peter. All right, we love you. Stay, stay fit. Just want to mention next week, we're going to bring the Archies. The Archies what? are coming to the Council's podcast. Ron Dante and Tony Wine are going to be. We're going to hear all about how that happened. Whoa, 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 whoa. And how in 1969, like they got Song of the Year with a cartoon group. We got to hear it. But are the cartoons coming or are the people coming? The people who we got Jughead, Veronica, Betty, and Archie coming. Got the answer. <laughs> and Peter Noon, God bless Peter Noon because what about the dog? <laughs> Peter Noon is is our leader. He's one of our our chieftains out there. And he is. And we God love him. He is. He really he and Peter Asher, all the Peters. <laughs> We're stalling. <laughs> Take care, Peter Noon. Thank you, Peter. Always calling. <laughs> Goodbye, <laughs> Peter. Bye, boys. See you next week. All right, everybody. Thank Thanks you so much. Take care, y'all. Love y'all. Yep.